This young entrepreneur has revolutionized how agents work. Please welcome to the stage, Glenn Sanford with eXp Realty. It's good down there, doesn't it? All right. So I was just saying as we were walking on stage that I think that Glenn is the most low-key, low-profile, innovative force in our industry. Um, and you know, testament to that, uh, Brad has actually recruited two interviewers to double team Glenn. <laughs> um, I, I actually have, I have a lot to say, just say it. <laughs> but, uh, well, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> so we just, we wanted to start off by asking you kind of how and why was the EXP concept born? EXP is such a, it really is such an innovative approach to building a brokerage. Yeah, um, so I was, uh, I was an agent, uh, and then I built a large team, and, and in 2007, converted that team to our own team-based brokerage. Uh, had a great 2007. We were really kind of doing this whole expansion concept long before there was expansion, so I was running six teams in six different cities um, in uh, 2004, 5, 6, 7. 2008, um, there were certain things that I just recognized. You know how uh, you, uh, if you're successful, one of the things that I, that I at least recognized was there's a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to change but couldn't change it while I was successful. Yeah. Like it just, that was just the, the, it's like, oh, I'd do this differently if I had another chance, and I'd do this differently if I had another chance. And, and then 2008 happened, and all of a sudden I got a chance. You know, so that, and, and there was, a, um, th and there were a few things that obviously took place during that period of time. One is in 2002 when I became a licensee, we were using dial-up and we had to go to the office to connect to the T1 so we could actually get some decent internet to do our job as real estate professionals. And uh, by 2008, going 2009, everybody had high speed in their pocket. And, and so now this whole idea of where do you get information, and of course consumers are, are now pretty much totally online at this point in time, and so we just sort of just made notes that whole time. We were buyer-based. Uh, we wanted to make a switch to listings at some point and be a more, more full-service brokerage. And uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2009, we had to close down two of our offices. We, were, we had a couple offices, or a couple of teams still uh, located in other, other brokerages, uh, but we closed down two of our offices. And we, we said, how do we build a business model that's not dependent on bricks and mortar? How do we build a a real estate brokerage, because we couldn't afford it. It really was not because we were like really, truly innovative. It was this sort of mother invention moment of, I can't afford offices, but I'm determined to build a model that's profitable. And then the other thing was all the things that me as an agent wanted in my previous brokerage. Uh, I said, well, why don't we figure out how to do the non bricks and mortar based brokerage and with that savings, pass on some of these things that I wanted as a, as a real estate professional. So that was really the iterative cycle. Yeah. The other piece that was really, that when we go to a non bricks and mortar based model, and this is something that, there was a light bulb that went off in 2009, it was people are gonna become orphans in their own organizations. And so, so our big thing was how do we solve that? And, and I'd built one of the largest online services in Western Canada back in the mid 90s. And I'd worked for AOL, so I was really about sort of social networks before there were social networks. And so we said, well, we could certainly do you know, Facebook and Facebook groups, but it really didn't uh, solve that sense of place. And at that point in time, and I just spent a couple days with uh, Philip Rosedale, who just founded Second Life here a couple days ago, uh, had some discussions with him and, and some other folks, but back then, Second Life was a big deal. It was a big social network using avatars. And uh, I said, well, why don't, why don't we do that? If, if nothing else, people will talk about us. You know, and, and, and you know, so when we think about unique selling propositions, if they're talking about you, that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we're saying, well, why don't we do that? And it creates a sense of place, a place to go to work. And yet I took my entire team and we went home and we came into the office virtually, and, and that really became this, this uh, really unique dynamic that allowed us to build and scale in a way that nobody else has scaled before. 
It's, I, I do think it's a really important thing to note. Um, even I, until recently, didn't understand the degree to which EXP agents participate in an avatar-based virtual world, which exists for them in the EXP brokerage. Right. Yeah, in fact, we, are, we were the single largest user of a virtual world for business of any company. And we're talking about military. We're talking about you know, big tech companies that have, and we were using it more than any of those companies, um, which was kind of interesting. And so because of that, we were over, technically over half the revenue of the company that we were actually doing business with. And as part one, I'm enthusiastic about technology. Uh, but the other part is we want to make sure that they continue to stay afloat in business and we could make the proper investments so that we could continue to scale, scale that to be able to be sort of worldwide using this sort of uh, remote workforce. Yeah, I have a question on that. If, you know, speaking of scale, do you, do you think there's a limit to the, to the overall market share that your company can gain from people that are more online based in their social interactions and prefer more that um, home office or office environment rather than the social interaction that may come in a traditional firm? Well, I think it's coming. You know, you, you look at the phenomenon that's just taking place with Fortnite right now. And if you look at Fortnite, and, and this is a you know, huge, massive multiplayer game, and, and I'm actually playing it at home with my daughter, who's, you know, she's 30 miles away from me, and we're getting online with our headsets on, and we're going into Fortnite and, and playing. And this is a massive multiplayer game. Um, these, the, I think the, the idea is that there's a lot of younger people, millennials, I'm, I refer to myself as the oldest millennial you'll ever meet. So, uh, but, but from that, uh, I think there is a, a large number of people who will work in this more engaged way. And there's huge amounts of money being poured into this space. I was just with the, uh, the president of HTC China yesterday before I flew here, and, and we're talking about the HTC Focus glasses, and he's going, hey, can you guys engage with that and work with that and do some cool stuff with that? Uh, there's a lot of money and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people that think that this is the future of work and we're just doing it now. Hmm. How do you reconcile that with uh, a, a very relationship-based business? Do you think that that goes away and, it, and we don't necessarily have a relationship-based business anymore at some point in the future? Or? Well, this is actually the whole, the whole concept is actually to build relationships using technology. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of, the, one of the things that came out yesterday is business models that can embrace uh, enabling technologies that facilitate relationships. See, one of the challenges that we, we do see, we see a lot of technology out there, but very few that actually foster relationships. And this is actually one of the few that actually fosters me coming in, sitting across the table, having a conversation, water cooler. We just had a Christmas, it was crazy, and, and I, I think this was Mitch Robinson's idea that, uh, who's sitting out there, but we had, the, we had some of the, 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 the team actually come in and do Christmas carols at our leadership meeting in Christmas. They're singing with, with full-on Christmas garb, and it, the, the, the whole, and we had about 500 people in the world, and we actually streamed this to our, to our own intranet, uh, which is Workplace by Facebook, any of those looking to adopt technology, a really easy technology to adopt, but uh, but we streamed it there, and it just it literally created you know more and and tighter relationships than than you would expect for a non bricks and mortar based business. So so your take is that the non bricks and mortar based business actually enhances the relationships. It's a different type of way. I mean, we still get together uh, when we sit physically together. There's endorphin releases and other things that take place but we have no offices for anyone. And so I actually literally, when I go to my office, I walk out of my front door, I walk to my casita door, I walk upstairs, and, and I'm, I'm, but then I'm also engaged with agents and brokers and staff all over the country that are doing exactly the same thing. And because we do it that way, we bridge the gap and we build that, that relational energy uh, using, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of companies have had a challenge with adopting virtual technologies is because when you physically work together as a leadership team or as an organization, um, you get that endorphin rush from this and you have to figure out a way to sort of break that addiction so you can actually go there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you imagine a world where your clients and customers ultimately enter into this virtual reality with you? Well, 
yeah, there's tons, I, uh, again, I was sort of with some real folks in this space here the last few days. There's so much money going into the space to facilitate those types of relationships right now. We might be still another five years out, but it may, we only may be two years out. I mean, the, the stuff that's going on with Oculus and HTC and, and virtual reality and all that is just, you know, it's cutting edge and there's billions of dollars going in that space to bridge that gap. And the new headsets that are coming out, and we're doing it 2D, 3D. So we're not actually putting the headsets, we're doing it you know, via our laptops and, and desktops. But the, the amount of money that's going into that space uh, and the amount of consumer engagement, uh, I think that there will be a percentage, it's small, but it could be meaningful to, 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 to us and others that sort of specialize in that space. And I'm curious, what, what is your view of the role of the managing broker, the traditional managing broker in all this? Because one of the things that your model has done is not only change the way we think about space, but also change the way we think about staffing right. and leadership in offices. Uh, much less of it in your model compared to traditional ones. Is, is the role of the managing broker less important, leaders less important in real estate going forward? Yeah, well, it's actually still the same. Um, you know, we're just engaging differently. So we, we now have state-based groups, city-based groups. We have, we have, we have Tuesday uh, meetings. Pretty much every state and every region has those. We still have in real life events that take place. Uh, they just don't happen to hap happen at our office because we don't have one, but it might be at a Regis, it might be at, 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 at any number of different locations. But we're highly connected and highly engaged. So, uh, you know, contract oversight, agent training, compliance and review, all that stuff still exists in our model. It's just done differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, last. Last summer, you and I were on a panel together that followed Brad's somewhat incendiary panel with Gary Keller. Yep. <laughs> and um, I, as a former Keller Williams agent, I'm curious what you think you learned from Keller Williams and what you think that Gary could learn from you and what you're doing today. Yeah, well, you know, I still think that the Red Book is the most important book that any real estate professional should could or should read. If you seriously, that is the best book. He, he opened my eyes in 2002 to the idea of a model that shares with its agents. And so for me, that was, that was huge. That was the reason why, actually in 2004, that's the reason I went there versus the other brokerages that I had to, to look at. Um, I, you know, I think that everybody's got a different lane and a different business model, and some are going to grow rapidly at different periods of time. Um, you know, some are going to get to a point where they're, they're, they've got the market share for that model, um, and, and then how do you iterate off that? I'm, you know, and that's always the constant question. How do you continue to move forward? I mean, every company that's got to scale has had to try to figure out how to disintermediate themselves to scale again, and I think that's where, where I think... Uh, Gary's at at the moment. Well, we are about to be joined by an, another set of innovators in the industry. Um, to my delight, all of these innovators are women. Uh, first, we have Kendall Butler, who's a broker owner from FLI Properties, Christine Kim, who's the president of Climb Real Estate, and Mael Gave, who is the COO of Compass, coming out to join us. <laughs> Oh, we're going to shuffle. Yes. There you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we've just had this conversation with Glenn about innovation and what he's doing in his business that's innovative. But I thought we might just do a like lightning round discussion of what each of you feels like your business is doing that is really innovative to kick off. Um, well, uh, I'm the uh, founder and broker of FLI Properties. Uh, just to give a little context, we uh, operate uh, south of Atlanta. We're in a suburb, uh, suburb south of Atlanta into Auburn, Alabama. And so our average home sale price uh, can be anywhere from, depending on the market, 165000 up to around 300000 So I'll probably relate with a lot more people uh, here that aren't from California and, and uh, in New York. But um, we are... Uh, 
always uh, trying to um, make sure that we're on the front end of any new technology. Um, we are consistently uh, in process improvement uh, with my background being in operations and engineering is that we've brought kind of a quality control and process improvement to our business. And we're always looking to see how can we be uh, more productive and be able to provide a better experience for our clients and for our agents. Um, we did this uh, throughout the, uh, the downturn. We, we have new construction business, we have foreclosure business, which REO business is only about 6% of the market right now, maybe 4% in some of the markets, uh, but it's about 25% of our market because of my business because most of the other REO agents got out of it. We know it's cyclical, we know it will come back, and so we kept all of those accounts, uh, like even though the Fannie Mae account's costing me money right now. Um, we bought 400, uh, four to 500 acres during the downturn. So I actually went back to school and got a master's in real estate development, so I would know how to develop that land. And so now uh, we do new construction, uh, single family infrastructure uh, in the markets that we cover, and we recruit builders and then we list homes for those builders. So we're actually creating the inventory, we're creating the market in the markets that we are in. Awesome. You know, Kendall, one of the things that we were talking about uh, earlier that I thought was really interesting is this idea of process improvement in technology. Could you give us an example of that? Like what specifically are you doing and how are you thinking about that in your business? Um, so uh, I was kind of dumbfounded when uh, I started bringing in agents into our business that I thought that most agents would work to the highest productivity available and that they would want to make the most money possible. And we found over the years that that necessarily isn't the case, that they usually work to their lifestyle. And uh, so we, um, the, all, everything that made me very successful, being very analytical and be, being very data-driven and results-oriented, we took with that and, and put it into a format that our clients and our agents can easily understand the data and be market experts almost immediately. So like and a dashboard of some sort? Yeah, yeah, we, we have tablets. Um, so, um, and we're actually, um, 2019, what we're rolling out is uh, all of our agents are going to have to pay for internet connectivity on their tablet and they cannot get leads unless they have their tablet with them, they're updating their CRM before they leave the appointment. Because we can have CRMs, but if they're not using them, it doesn't help me and know where we're at in our business at any time. So we're requiring our agents to use the tablets and to update the CRM or they don't get leads. Our, um, our commission splits are between 40 and 65%. And the way that we do that is we offer ultra, um, uh, support to our agents and that we, we have closing coordinators and we give them a very controlled um, risk managed environment so that they can succeed and uh, but they get to practice. So if you look at the average real estate agent that only sells you know, it's going up to, I think, to around nine homes a year, but that was, you know, between four and six homes a year if, that, if they had more than four years experience that they sold four to six. But if they had less than four years experience, they only sell two homes a year. How do you become an expert doing something two times a year? You can't become an expert at anything doing it twice yeah. a year. So I have an agent, his name's Brett Chapman, that he got his license in De December 17th of 2017. And, um, and in 2018, so he had no real estate experience, he had a military background, uh, some construction, and he came into our business and he did 22 sales last year, and he's on pace to do 54 this year. That's great. That's a brand new agent. So we're providing the technology, the training, the data, to make them market experts, and we're very involved in our community, so we are actively engaged. Yeah. Um, and so you know, I know, Christine, that's yep, sure. the, 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 how do you engage and integrate agents into yep. the business, make them successful? Absolutely. I know that's a big focus of yours as well. What yeah, are you doing absolutely. that's innovative and interesting in that space? Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Christine Kim. Um, just a really quick little bit about Climb. Um, we're the classic Silicon Valley startup story, really. It was two guys, two normal agents who had technology surrounded um, around them and we're just wondering, geez, like why is our professional life so difficult when everything is so accessible to us in our personal lives? And so that's how, you know, Climb got started and it was really innovating with technology in our backyard and being able to adopt that and um, create a brokerage that was all about collaboration, individuality, which is really important to your question, and um, diversity, and then really focusing on empowering the agent to make them successful. And so to answer your question, Brandon, one of those things, one of the things that we have that you, know, you can potentially take away is we have a program called the Climb Sherpa. Well, so <laughs> everyone knows what a Sherpa is. Um, yeah. You know, it helps you through climb Mount Everest if any of you guys have ever climbed Mount Everest. But you know, we found that 
in a life cycle of an agent from when they come on board, it's really easy for us to lose track of them and it's really easy for them to get lost. You know, from new agent who's you know, never done a deal before, you know, doesn't even know how to order a business card, all the way to, hey, you know, I think I need to start a team right? <laughs> or you know, really expand my business. So as part of some of our, one of our agent support programs, the Sherpa has been really, really great and you know, I think as a takeaway, no matter where you do business, you know, we're in San Francisco in the Bay Area right now, um, you, know, you can really analyze like, how your agents go about um, going through the life cycle of their business and be able to advocate for them at every step of the way. And that's, be, that's really made our agents a lot more productive or, or one of the reasons why our agents are being really productive right now. Right, and, and Maya, you, I know that uh, Compass has a variety of different approaches and getting people up and running. Um, predominantly, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is putting them on teams. Could you tell us a little bit more about, from an innovation standpoint, how are you guys thinking about some of the stuff that the, these two women just talked about in, in getting agents to be successful early in the context of the environment that we're in now, which is heavily technology-based. Mm -hmm. Glenn was just speaking to the fact that things are changing rapidly. What's your take on that? Good morning. Um, so I think when, when we, when we started thinking about what Compass is, we started thinking um, we started thinking about it from the Asian perspective, and we started thinking about what are the problems that our agents and agents who are not Compass Asian yet, like what are the problems that they have, and how can technology help them? The idea was never to um, to have technology uh, replacing the agents, but technology empowering the agents, and we came to some very basic conclusions. Uh, the first one was that our agents were operating in an incredibly fragmented environment. So 800 MLS, hundreds of software that they can try to use which are not necessarily connected with each other. It's difficult to be an agent and uh, to use technology uh, because everything is so fragmented. The second thing that we heard loud and clear from them was that they were not uh, spending, as per their words, they were not spending enough time with their clients because they were spending so much time doing everything else. Uh, starting from building and managing teams, but also doing a lot of paperwork and a lot of very repetitive tasks where fundamentally this is not where the value added is. So that was the second problem. And then the third problem um, was that they were fundamentally at the center of the real estate industry because they are the point of contact with the clients and the client goes to them for advices and so the agent really connects everyone with everyone in the industry but somehow it was getting increasingly difficult for them and so when we talked about what we wanted to bring from an innovative perspective we say okay we need to try to solve these problems and so bottom line what we're trying to do is to build this end-to-end -end integrated platform that allows an agent to go uh, through one platform, not, uh, not a few hundred, number one, that allows that agent to go through the entire process on the platform so that they can gain time uh, and they can focus on what they're the best in the world at, which is the, the contact, the personal relationship with their clients. And then uh, lastly, when we, when we talk about this end-to-end -end platform, we saw it at the beginning of a general vision of an ecosystem where once you have the platform, you can bring the escrow mortgage title company, you can bring vendor services in it, and you put the Asian truly at the center. And so when we think about innovation, that's what we're thinking about. I think it's important to note that when we talk about innovation, people often immediately go to technology, but innovation speaks to many different aspects of thinking differently about business. Yep. And I think I would be curious to hear from each of you, your opinions, you know, I think th there's business model innovation, um, you know, the, and I think that can apply both to revenue, so how you make your money, and several of you have mentioned different approaches to actually making money in the brokerage industry, and that it can also apply to almost like your cost base, and technology often comes in on the cost-based part, right? So technology can often cut costs and increase efficiency. But Glenn, you know, maybe we can go around quickly what do you think? Is it you know, revenue innovation, tech-enabled tech cost innovation, or a combination of two that you think is most important? Uh, well, I, I think for us, we sort of said, let's play a 
different game. Yeah. Um, with the, and, and I think where you start to think about the financial side, first of all, to run a virtual campus versus physical bricks and mortar, you know, we're automatically saving 80% of our expense. Yeah. Um, and we're able to leverage our team uh, about 5x, so just in terms of just that. So, so we're automatically get sort of some of the, the economic benefits just from being running it differently. So, but where we really focus our time and attention is uh, we, we use a net promoter score. Uh, we work on the cultural aspects of the business as being our big differentiator. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have such an enthusiastic agent base is because uh, we, we, fe we feel that the innovation really is around culture yeah. as opposed to the financial side. One, you, you have to have a business model that makes sense financially, and I think we've got that, but if we don't have the culture side right, this whole thing falls apart. Yeah, and we're very intentional on our technology and on our expenses and our cost. Um, we're, we're very revenue focused on, so 40% uh, of our agents are salaried agents. Uh, so I think that's you know pretty different than you'll find. Um, I, we don't go off the numbers. I'm not trying to get you know 50,000 agents. Um, I need enough agents to cover my market and to do the you know to get the market share that that we want. And um, so in the technology, we it's take it or leave it. Does it bring solutions? Does it bring me value? Does it bring my clients and my agents value? And so if it do, if it doesn't work, if it's not being used, you know, then we don't implement it. Um, and um, but, but the main thing is. Um, with my salaried agents, I can control how they work, when they work, you know, where they work. Um, and you can't do that with commission agents. And, um, and so I want the hybrid of both of them. And then, but with my commission agents, I, I have the expectation that they're the market experts and that they're doing everything they can to get to the place that I want them to be. And most of my salaried agents move out into commission agents. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, innovation is such an overused word, like you said, and it's, or it can be interpreted in so many different ways. Um, you know, culture is number one for Climb. I mean, if you, the minute you walk into our office, everything we do is about really innovating around culture and bringing that lifestyle of a business to the office. And you know we are a collaborative team. We love all the guys out on the fifth floor, and we really like to adopt as many technologies as we can. But I think the key is, um, you know, it's really hard to deploy technology and just say, "Hey, agents, here's you know, first.io, use it." you know, or whatever, I'm just thinking of what's out there right now. But it's more about, hey, how do we map out the agent journey through a buyer transaction, a seller's transaction, even just a basic workflow of how do I do my work with my assistant? We map out that journey. We were all agents, all the management team, the founders, we were agents. We were agency built by agents for agents, so we know the pains. And if we can't deploy it ourselves, then it's really difficult to expect your agent um, population to be able to use it. So in terms of innovation, we want to make sure that we innovate within the process, not necessarily build new technology. So sorry We're about that. We're out of time, but yes. I just want to give my out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <A moment>. Sorry. <laughs> to say, because I, I actually think this has been one of um, the really interesting discussions about Compass. Are you guys sort of changing? What is it that you're changing? Oh, that's a big question. I'm going to need more than 10 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> we're going to need that for five seconds or less. <laughs> I think what we're, what we're trying to do is to really combine the high technology and the high human side. So we keep talking about high touch, high tech, and that's really, to me, I mean, I'm a, I'm a tech executive. I come from the technology industry, and I spent 15 years explaining to a lot of very big technology company that uh, technology should be serving people, not people serving technology. And I think if I had to wrap it up in like five seconds, <laughs> what we're really trying to do is to do that. We're trying to create super agents who are going to be empowered by unique technology, by powerful technology that will give them more time to spend with their clients, more opportunity to defend their split, uh, to defend their commission, because we are in an environment where commissions are going down. And if you're just a salesman, you're not gonna be able to maintain your, your commission. Technology should be here so that you can be a business advisor, that you can be here to help your client, and so that's what we're trying to do. Did I do it, man? 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you for our panelists. Clearly, we could spend an hour just with you. Yeah. We really appreciate a tremendous amount of gratitude to you for taking your time today. Great job, huh? Round of applause, please. Thank you.